What's up, everybody? Today's episode is phenomenal. We talk about food sensitivities with one of the world's uh, best functional medicine practitioners, Dr. Stephen Cabral. He is the man when it comes to functional health and wellness. And in today's episode, we talk about foods that can cause reactions in your body that aren't so obvious, but still have profound effects on everything from muscle building to fat loss, to health, cravings, your skin, your hair. And it's sometimes hard to connect the dots because it's not a food allergy. It doesn't happen right away. Let's say you do that every day for breakfast because eggs are super nutritious. They've got all B vitamins and so much more, right? So you're doing that every day and you're just wondering why a week, two weeks, two months later, you just start to feel like overall just more inflamed and just you're not recovering as well. Well, anyway, they have a test. It's a food allergy, excuse me, food sensitivity test that tests for specific antibodies. And in today's episode, Justin, Adam, and myself reveal the results of our test. Wow! Whoa! Uh, wow. I knew, dude. I'm, I'm, par I'm partially excited and meat. disappointed at the same wow. time. Damn it. Anyway, they do have this test. They are offering a discount for our listeners. We don't normally don't do this, but I know you guys are interested. So if you're interested, go to stephencabral.com forward slash food test. Um, and you can see it here. That's where you want to go to get that. It'll be give you $120 off. Also, if you want a free program, we're giving them away. We're going to give away today MAPS Anabolic. If you want that, if you want a chance to win, this is what you do. Leave a comment below this video the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale right now. Map Symmetry is half off and the RGB bundle is half off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Dr. Cabral, welcome back to the show. Did you know that your clip on our Instagram is the most viral one that we have? Did you know that? No, I had no idea. Which, which clip was that? It's, uh, which one is it? You're winning. No, it's, oh, you meant that. No, no, no. no it he's, is, he's I'll tell you top one. which one it is. There, yeah. There's a couple that are actually performing well, but there's one that is continuing to just keep going. It is, ba, ba, ba. Yeah, well, I just, we I think, typically repost them and, and they've been, oh, three, I mean, they've been it, fantastic. It's the three steps for sleep. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you do a really good job communicating. That's why we have you back on. You obviously know what you're talking it's about. 1.1 million crush still growing. And, oh, I appreciate that. And today, uh, we're going to talk about food sensitivities and food sensitivity tests. I know you did. You have the results of our tests. So we can see why Justin's doing so bad and let's say I'm doing so good. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, you're as, right there with me, pal. Have you done, I know, as, have, as you've done in the past, uh, you've, you've kind of broken them down. They've been very valuable to us. But I want to open up by like, what's, what is a food sensitivity? How is it different than a food allergy? Is it also an immune reaction? Like what, what's the difference? How do we discern between the two? Yeah, it's a great question. And so the, the big thing between a food sensitivity and a food allergy, the food allergies are more life-threatening. So although everybody lumps uh, sensitivities together with allergies, they're really not the same. So a food allergy would be, we hear about it typically with children and peanuts or maybe strawberries, and it creates more of an anaphylactic-based shock. So the body actually has what's called an IgE-based reaction. We can talk about those immunoglobulins because it's really important when deciphering between are we testing for a sensitivity or an allergy. So an allergy will begin to create massive amounts of inflammation within seconds to minutes of consuming that food, and it can begin to close up the airway. And so then the antidote to that, of course, is an EpiPen or some type of norepinephrine adrenaline-based stimulant to open back up those airways. So sensitivities then are more the symptoms of brain fog, hives, um, sleepiness, potentially after a meal, itchy skin, migraines, headaches, joint pain, overall inflammatory-based syndrome. That's more sensitivity rather than an allergy, although we use them kind of interchangeably. So you said IgE for the strong anaphylactic shock type reaction. Are we looking for other immu immunoglobulins for sensitivities? Are they? Is it not IgE? What are we looking for? Yeah, so IgE is the one that conventional medicine is most interested in because, of course, it can cause an anaphylactic shock. The issue is that you could give a child peanuts once and there's no reaction. We call that essentially the primer. And the second time they consume it, again, whether it be strawberries or peanuts or something else, that is when the reaction can take place. So it's fairly difficult to figure out an IgE-based immune reaction until the immune system has actually been primed. 
So we don't necessarily look for that in natural health, natural-based medicine. What we're looking for is an IgM or an IgG reaction. The difference with those is we're now looking for sensitivities. They cause inflammation because what happens is the white blood cells, those are just called immunoglobulins, go after the protein typically in a food, an amino acid strand, and that causes inflammation. The inflammation now for you, Sal, might be Um, it might be joint pain, let's say in your lower back. And for Adam, maybe for you, it's, uh, inflammation on your skin. And Justin, for you, it might be, I don't know, it could be like digestive bloating or something like that. And Doug, maybe for you, it's headaches or brain fog. Like it's different in every individual. The symptoms are based on your genetic predisposition, but what it does is still it's mediated by an inflammation immune-based response. So the best way to think of this is IgE is an immediate response. IgM is a delayed response and IgG is a a latent response, typically two to three days later, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours later, Mm. which is why it's so difficult to find out your actual food sensitivities. Because let's say we're recording this on a Tuesday, I could ask you, hey, what'd you have Saturday night for dinner or Sunday you know, at breakfast? And you may have no idea because you've eaten nine meals or, you know, 16 meals since then. Yeah. And so oftentimes what people do is they'll eat something two days later start to get this kind of immune response that Mm -hmm. is like, like you said, gastro distress, skin issue, whatever. And then they'll attribute it to what they just ate instead of what they ate two days ago. So that can make it so challenging to identify what's going on. I wouldn't even think to go back that far. Nope. Also people tend to compare themselves to say like a friend who has something right. And they're like, Oh, well that, that food gives them this and think that their response because they don't have the same response that they don't potentially have the same issue, right? Would you say that uh, that the tendency is whatever your autoimmune tendency is, whether it's skin, gut, brain fog, that's where you're probably going to see these kind of low level immune responses? Yeah, absolutely. But the food sensitivities could be multiple. And so, although an autoimmune is typically limited to the thyroid or the joints or the myelin sheath on the nervous system, um, you'll get multiple of those. We kind of call that the rain barrel effect, right? So it's like, oh, I don't feel as energetic today. I don't have the same energy. My exercise recovery is weaker. I'm starting to get a little bit more inflammation from my workouts. I'm just not quite as sharp. It all starts to add up from systemic-based inflammation because even though the food we ate is it's in our gut, right? So it goes through the mouth, down the esophagus, through the stomach, into the 20 or so feet of small intestine and then out through the colon, which is like five or six feet, the inflammation is from the immune system outside of the gut. And so that can lead to anywhere else in the body. And one more point I just wanted to add was that a lot of people confuse bloating and gas or constipation or loose stool with a food sensitivity. It's not necessarily the case. That can actually just be a digestive issue. That could be too much candida overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth. That could be H. pylori, could be parasites. But it could also just be you're lactose intolerant. You can't handle the specific sugar, let's say, in dairy-based products. So there's also a difference between just digestive distress and these latent responses, which can be totally separate from the food, meaning like from your gut. They can be in any part of your body. Now, this delayed response, like the IgG response versus <coughs> like the IgM or whatever you described was, can it be as intense, even though it's delayed, or is this like typically a little bit less um, severe? It's a good question. And usually it is less severe. The problem is it becomes chronic if we're always eating those foods on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, you you eat the same, let's say breakfast every day. Let's say you're sensitive to egg whites, um, which is more common to be sensitive to egg whites than the actual egg yolk. And we can get into that if you'd like. But let's say you do that every day for breakfast because eggs are super nutritious. They've got all B vitamins and so much more, right? So you're doing that every day. And you're just wondering why a week, two weeks, two months later, you just start to feel like overall just more inflamed and just you're not recovering as well. And so you might never put it together that the compounding effects of the inflammation are actually from some of the foods that you're eating and not necessarily from, you know, not getting the right sleep or the (laughs) right, you know, exercise protocol. It could actually be based on the foods that you are eating. And that's the thing is they could be healthy foods. Mm -hmm. Today, as we go through your labs, we're going to go through 190 healthy foods. We're not going to go through unhealthy foods. We're going to go through normal foods that a lot of people eat. They don't necessarily eat all 190, 
but you'll get to see which ones cause the biggest sensitivity. So yes, they start out low level. Like you wouldn't even notice them. Just not as much energy when waking up in the morning or your heart rate variability is a little bit lower um, or resting heart rate's a little bit higher. And then it's just over time that inflammation compounds if you continue to eat the food. The last thing I'd say is, let's say you only eat the food you know, once a week or uh, every, once or twice a week. You have days where you're feeling good and you have days where you're feeling terrible and you have no idea why. And that can literally be based on the food that you're eating. Now, I have a question on, uh, you, you mentioned your gut issues may be due to things like candida or dysbiosis, or you can't digest lactose. My understanding of some of these immunoglobulins or immune reactions is that you can develop them because you have, let's say, poor digestion for one of those reasons or another, which causes gut inflammation. The inflammation of the gut increases intestinal wall hyperpermeability or permeability, otherwise known as leaky gut. So then the proteins leak through the gut where they're not supposed to. The body recognizes it as an invader, mounts an immune response. And so then you have now developed a sensitivity to a food that you didn't have before. And if you fix the gut issue, remove the food for a while, you'll the sensitivity will go away and you'll be able to get the food again. Is this true? I, and I experienced this myself going through this process years ago, is that what happened to me? Am I hitting the nail on the head? Yeah, I mean, that's basically a mic drop right there. I mean, that's that's how the whole process works. Right? That's <laughs> okay. how autoimmune conditions are created. Okay. You know, people think that autoimmune conditions are, are a mystery. It's one part gut hyperpermeability and one part stress. You combine the two, you have a wildly over-exaggerated immune response, but the immune system is not really not doing its job. It's doing its job. It's just seeing proteins or bacteria or pathogens in your blood that were never meant to be there. I mean, if you think about it, and for anybody watching this on video, you know, I've got my little buddy here, Walter, that I always use. And it just shows like the stomach moves into the uh, small intestine. It's about, again, it's about 20, 21 feet or so. And then it goes into five to six feet of colon. Well, this is meant to be the outside of your body, inside your body. It's literally a tube that goes from your mouth all the way through your body to your anus. Like that's literally it. And it's only supposed to let the good stuff into the body through a single cell permeable uh, membrane of your intestines. And all the bad stuff then mostly bacteria is supposed to come out of your body when you have a bowel movement. And the problem is when literally we're letting those pathogens or whole proteins into our bloodstream, our immune system has nothing else that it can do except to respond to that. You want them to. And the thing is now with autoimmune issues, we give people what biological based drugs to actually shut down their immune system. So they don't go after the actual, let's say protein or pathogen it's seen, and it can unfortunately affect them in many other ways. That's why we try to always look for the root cause. Food sensitivities are only one part to this. Um, and I will say that on two of your labs here today, uh, we can't diagnose that, but I think we have really good uh, really good data to be able to say this looks like a case potentially of gut permeability. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. That's going to be exciting. So, so uh, to add to that, then if you are, if you do have gut issues, which then causes the inflammation, inflammation causes the cells to spread out. Now they're more permeable. You develop an immune response. Is it safe to say then, because here's the thing that I used to get all the time with when I had a wellness studio, I had somebody that did gut testing and food sensitivity testing. And I remember the number one comment people would get would say, wow, it's all the foods I eat all the time that are, that are lighting this up. But if you have intestinal hyperpermeability or gut hyperpermeability, you're going to have sensitivities to the foods you eat all the time because that's what you eat all the time. And that's what goes through the gut. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And the thing is with the new tests, so there are different phases of IgG testing. So a lot of people say food sensitivity testing isn't true. It's just reacting to the foods that you eat all the time. Well, there's two parts to that. So we run <laughs> maybe 10,000 plus just of this you know, particular lab. And so a normal food sensitivity test comes back with maybe two to three sensitivities. That's about it. That that's a nice healthy gut and you show you actually see reactions. So, you know, as we go through this there's four different tiers of sensitivity. The first tier there's still a sensitivity. That means that the immune system recognizes this particular protein sequence or amino acid sequence and it's not saying that this is something harmful and we have to go after it. It is just saying recognized not an issue. And that's where the people uh, have some confusion over IgG. But when you have a tier three or tier four reaction mm. to an actual food sensitivity, that means it's somehow in uh, 
it, well, here's the thing. Immune cells can actually go through your gut wall into your intestines as well. But when we look at IgG, it's typically outside. So these have seeped outside the body, but it can also be what's called uh, cross-pollination or molecular mimicry, where certain protein strands look very similar to other ones. For example, when I first did this, when I was 19 years old, I had this test run to figure out what was wrong with me because no doctor, conventional medicine-wise, could figure it out. I was, I was sensitive to things like kidney beans. And the thing is, like, I've never eaten kidney beans. I never liked kidney beans, not even in chili, whatever they've been. It's just, I don't like that. And it showed up high. <coughs> Why would that be? Hmm. Well, there's this particular sequence still of amino acids in that kidney bean that my immune system... Uh, natively is going to respond to. So we all have foods that we might be sensitive to through gut permeability, but we also typically innately have a couple foods that our body and our immune system do not like, and they attack as if they're a pathogen. And that's why this test is very valuable, even for healthy people. For me, almonds keep showing up after all these years, even though almonds are totally popular and healthy food, there's nothing wrong with them, right? But they are for me. And that's why for me, I just don't eat almonds. I can eat other nuts like macadamia nuts or whatever I choose to. Dr. Cabral, what is the uh, the accuracy of these food sensitivity tests? I, and there's tons of them that I see on the market. Is there a difference mm -hmm. between all of them or are they all testing the same way and for the same things? They test a little bit differently. Some test IgE, IgM, and IgG. Some combine IgM and IgG response. I like those as well. We just, so I'll, I'll tell you, we just do IgG. And the reason we do that is that it's pretty easy to figure out your IgE response, even if it's not an allergy. When you eat a food, you get itchiness in the back of your throat. Yeah, you know right now, again, that could be, it could be mold. It could be something else, but like you get hives, you get a headache within 20, 30 minutes. That, that's an IgE response. We, we can figure those out. Like if you eat shellfish and you have a hives, you don't eat shellfish and you don't need to spend you know the money for that. But an IG an IGM is pretty good too. But that one's a little bit more challenging to even, I don't want to use the word diagnose because we're not, you know, conventional medicine here, but to recognize, and that's because IGM is basically an intermediary response that's leading to an IgG sensitivity. So IG uh, e is in the blood, IgM is in the blood, IgG is actually in the blood and the tissues. So you get that deeper inflammatory response from IgG sensitivities. And that's why, to me, those are the most interesting because I'm always looking at underlying root cause. And I'm not using the food sensitivity test as like the end all be all. I'm doing that as part of what we call the big three. So it's part of the Candida you know, lab that we run, Candida metabolic and vitamins test, and the bacteria and parasite stool test. So if I'm looking at your uh, two of your food sensitivity tests here today, and I see quite a bit of sensitivities, like more than a dozen, I'm saying, okay, uh, what we want to look for next is we want to prove this out. Let's run the candida metabolic and vitamins test, or let's run the bacteria and parasite stool test to actually see what imbalances are here that may have caused this permeability. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. So one more okay. thing, because I remember going <clears throat> through this as well with people um, was that because the complete there's there's a there's a complete approach here and if you do it in an incomplete way and I want to make sure I say this to people so they understand then you're not going to really solve the problem and and here's what some people would do with one of these tests they'd get this test and come back here's the seven foods that you're hyper reactive to they remove those foods they feel better immediately but they switch to other foods and then over time because they never fixed the hyper permeability they now develop sensitivities to those foods. So this is the, this is a, a common thing that you see. It's like, oh my God, I stopped eating this and now I'm reacting to this and I stopped eating that. Now what do I eat? Right? So you have to also solve the root issue of why you're developing these sensitivities, not just remove the food. Correct? Yeah, hundred percent. That's exactly right. And cause you'll, you'll solve the inflammation for a while, which is great. So you do feel better. You like begin to immediately empty that rain barrel. And so people will definitely feel better, skin issues, headaches, migraines, joint pain, et cetera. Um, but like you said, you haven't tackled the candida, the bacterial imbalance, the H. pylori, the parasites, the whatever it might be. Um, but at least you'll get some relief, at, which is really nice. And then you'll be able to work on those as well. So yeah, there's a few different ways that people can attack it. They can assume they might have a bacterial or candida imbalance, and they can do something like a CBO protocol, or they might assume they have parasites, and they can do a, you know, parapro support protocol. They can do whatever they feel is appropriate. Our job is not to like do a million tests to say, okay, we need to just keep looking, looking. But the goal is you do want to find the underlying root cause, and at home lab testing like we're doing right now, absolutely gets you there. There's just no doubt about it. There's no other way to be able to pinpoint these things, not only for getting well, but also for anti-aging and longevity. A lot of people just assume that everything is good. 
And I think that's a difficult assumption. It's better to do your blood work every year and then something like your at-home labs, your big five every year to make sure everything's good. Because if not, you catch in the early stages, make a couple of tweaks to your diet, your supplements, your protocols, and then you are good to go. So yeah. that, that's what we hope to solve. With Can this. IgA, IgM, IgG antibodies eventually lead to a rise of IgE antibodies where you start to develop the more uh, Im immediate reaction? Is there a connection between them? It's a good question. I don't think that I know the answer to the IgG causing a higher IgE because I do know that sensitivities <sighs> don't cause allergies. Um, so that's the good news. Okay. However, they can absolutely lead to more sensitivities. Um, so there's no doubt about that. And one you mentioned that we didn't talk about was IgA. So IgA is an interesting one too, because what happens is the more sensitivities and the more inflamed you become, the more stressed your body is, it actually decreases IgA, which is secretory IgA. And IgA is a different white blood cell. It's contained in all the mucus lining, essentially, of the skin, the nasal passages, the mucosa of the body. And it's our first line defense against viruses and all sorts of different pathogens. Well, the more stressed you are, the more your IgA, IgA levels drop. That means you actually have a weaker immune system by just being more inflamed. Wow. And part of that is from foods. Wow. All right. One last question before we get to our tests. I know people are, are just clamoring to, to see those. <laughs> we are. I know all of us are. <laughs> like, get, get to my, my test. My stomach's <laughs> reacting yeah, already. I know. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to calm uh, it down. You know, super exciting yeah. um, uh, to, to do that. Do you, uh, are, are these popping up more because of the kinds of foods that we're eating, the things mm. that are in our foods, the lifestyles that would lead it, it, because it seems like gut issues in general, or is it just more awareness, but it does seem like they're a lot more pre prevalent today. Yeah. Uh, part of it is the testing for sure. You're going to find more of it if, if you test more, but I actually believe that it's from more glyphosate contamination. I think that's a mm. big part of it. I think, um, Plastics and estrogens in the environment, you know, xenoestrogens from the environment are, are a big factor. Uh, people don't even know, like taking and just, you know, having tea, like, oh, I'm being healthy. I'm having a, a tea and dropping this tea bag in. Most are made from microplastics, the actual tea bag, and you're getting just billions of nanoparticles of plastic in your body from these tea bags. I just think we live in a way more toxic wow. world, and these things are being digested through our gut. I mean, if we take glyphosate, for example, even contamination against a lot of clean, organic, healthy foods because glyphosate is essentially airborne. And what happens is even with, uh, so back in the day, this is how they use glyphosate. They sprayed it when the crops were young. So you'd be planting your crops and at the same time, you'd start to see them pop up. You would see weeds pop up. And so then you would spray glyphosate across the whole field and it would kill all the weeds and the you know Roundup resistant GMO based foods, they wouldn't be affected by the, the glyphosate or the Roundup. But then over time, what they realized was that towards the end of harvest season, if for some reason their crop got wet or it got uh, too moldy before being harvested, it was basically ruined. So they found that glyphosate sprayed at the end of harvest season as well. It's a desiccant, right? Where it right? could be washed off. Would exactly would then be stuck on the food. So before there were even one, I'm not saying the glyphosate was ever good, but when it was only sprayed at a young stage of the crop, I mean, over months, it would be for the most part washed off. And then there are foods, of course, where it just goes into the skin that you can't remove. And glyphosate is a known um, antibacterial, so much so that now, because people are so against glyphosate, like people know about it now, they're actually looking, how can we use this glyphosate in other ways? They're actually looking at it as a now an antibiotic, <laughs> which in the natural health field, we've been saying it all along, it is an antibiotic. Yeah. It's killing your gut bacteria. And so- yeah, I think that's a big part of it too. All right. All right. Let's get to the test. Let's see what's going on here, Dr. Cabral. Let's start. I don't know, wherever you want to start, but let's see what happens here. We're going to go from, uh, we're going to, because we're all friends here. We're going to go from least offensive to most offensive. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, uh, so who, who's going to win? Is Doug going to win? You, this uh, you want to take some bets? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, well, I got the order. I've always been second. Uh, I haven't been best. I haven't been worst yet, but my gut historically is terrible, although it's been a lot better lately. So I don't know where I'm going to I'm going to guess it's going to go in this order. Uh, Doug the best, then Sal next, then Justin, then me. Justin, you think I, you're the worst, huh? I do think I'm the worst. Wow. I mean, I'm, I, I have the, I, and I also think that that's why is because I've never been able to get to the, the, the single thing or 
whatever that causes the psoriasis to flare up all the time. And I have a feeling that it's because <coughs> I got a bunch of offenders. That's my you guess. Got, you got full of parasites. That's my yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my guess. <laughs> I, hope I, be, yeah. I actually, I actually hope I'm the worst because then it'll f- make me feel like we're we're getting somewhere with getting to the bottom right. of my shit. All right, so. who's for, who's first, Doctor? Mm, right. Well, we'll we'll find out. So up first is Doug. Ah, and <laughs> Doug, the healthiest. I feel like I, knew this. I he's always the healthiest. No, I've lost every other one. Yes. Oh yeah, that's right. I've lost every other one. That's true. Cortisol yeah. levels off the chart, all that <laughs> stuff. You must have a grant made out of steel, yeah. man, with all that stress, huh? Yeah. Ma- right. Imagine with all the stress. All right, so what's right. Doug sensitive to? Yeah, so just to give you a little insight in this test, basically when you look at it, you're looking at a green bar, like a, a lighter lime bar, a yellow bar, and then an orangey red bar. And so we expect to see these little black lines, which do show immune reaction to the foods. So as long as they're within the green, you're good. If you have any, and we'll say the mild, it's typically eliminating the food for about six weeks. We'll go over this too at the end, if you'd like. Uh, The moderate reaction, we're going to eliminate that for about 12 uh, weeks, a little bit more we could. And then the red, we're eliminating for about six months. So when I look at Doug's and I'm going through the dairy and I'm going through the beans and peas, it goes through fruit, it goes through grains, it goes through, uh, let's see, fish and seafood. We'll stop there for a moment. So there are basically no reactive dairy, beans, peas, fruit, or grains. That's one page. The second page goes through fish, uh, seafood, nuts, seeds, and some vegetables. Doug, the only one that you have a specific sensitivity to is a type of tuna. So um, that would be one, not like the wild albacore, but a, another type of tuna. So again, even if you're not eating tuna, I say you know you can still have a mild reaction. This one's very mild, but it still is worth noting. And then the last page, we go over a bunch of vegetables and we go over herbs and spices. So no vegetables, Doug, are you sensitive to, uh, but you are set mildly sensitive to miso, like in miso oh. soup. Oh, that's terrible, Doug. Yeah, he's a big yeah. fan of miso. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't eat it often, but I do But eat you it. love it. Yeah. I had some last Sunday, so. Oh. Yeah, also, so that's that's typically then going to be about so a sad. Week. <laughs> 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 All right, I was about to say something. Right. Yeah. He's yeah. very sensitive to uh, short jokes too, so that's got to come. Wow, out there oh. so. <laughs> had, to, had to take you down a notch there, Doug. After you just kicked our ass with health again. Yeah. Uh, that's why he's got such good skin and everything, huh? Yeah. All right, keep it going. Keep it going. Right. So that's it. One sensitivity. All right. Who's second? Next One. up. One. Well. You think Adam. it's me? Wow! Whoa! Uh, wow. I'm, 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 par- I'm partially excited and disappointed meat. at the same wow. time. Damn it. I'm the now, worst. Adam, Sounds I will say, though, second. if you're consuming any dairy products, they're very high in terms of sensitivity. Boom! Uh, Told you. I've had ice cream every night for the last five days. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> <laughs> for the last five years, I've had ice cream every No, no, five days. Um, five days. In I know. Month. I'm just joking around with you. So, um, you put Kate, cheese on Kate stuff all the time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Casein's in the moderate zone. Cheddar is in the mild zone. Cow's milk is into the red. Goat's milk is mild. Mozzarella is mild. Sheep is fine. Whey is mild. And yogurt is into the red. So essentially, when you look at that, casein is in all milk products, except for essentially whey. And so it would be sensitive to most cow's milk-based products. Now, most people are not sensitive to sheep or goat. And I run this lab all the time, and they're not sensitive to those. You are actually mildly sensitive to goat's milk, which is not as common. So for you, I'd recommend eliminating all dairy for a good twelve weeks. But he did work on a farm, to. and it was that wasn't that goat girlfriend? Had for <laughs> a little while? No, that I mean, uh, no, I've talked to the guys <laughs> on air before that I've I've always picked up on the dairy, and I've been able to tolerate. Uh, small amounts of it, but I've always said that if I had two things of dairy in a day, I always notice a difference. So that totally makes sense. But I'm going to yeah, eliminate it, it completely now. Right. So uh, is almond milk an okay replacement for me? In in it has nothing to do with dairy, but although the, you may be yep. going down the no, list. No, no, I'm see. saying in replace of like oh, milk yeah. is what I'm saying. Is that okay? So you could use, you could absolutely use any type of nut milk uh, okay. that you wanted to. Just look out for carrageenan and other preservatives that you don't want okay. in there, but yes, for sure. Okay. So the only other one in your lab test was actually egg whites, which was a mild reaction. Oh, interesting. Yep. So on the mild side. Now keep in mind, and I should have stated this in the beginning, the three most common food sensitivities that we see amongst people are cow's milk, egg whites, and then it would be gluten, yeah. uh, a wheat-based intolerance. Yeah. So those are the three most common. So even if like it, you should always run to see what your sensitivities are, but eliminating those for skin-based issues, especially eczema. Uh, we always eliminate those. We eliminate soy. We eliminate corn. We eliminate a few others as well. Okay. Wow. 
All right. Well, All right. Who do you think's up next? Is it Justin or I? Yeah, this is it. We're getting down. God, to I'm the so end. much it's, better yeah. than I used to be too, but I know I'm not great. Yeah. Right? yeah. All right, Justin's the worst. I, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. not though. No, 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 I'm the guy with no. the. Bro, I've been. Gut I stuff think forever. it's uh, next up is Justin. No. no. So, so and Adam, one thing I do want to say is that there's still that lab that we've chatted about in the in the past. Anyone that's dealing with psoriasis or so dealt with in the past is to look at the bacteria and parasite stool test. It, it really is the number one lab to look. I mean, that's what I've been waiting stool. to do with you. I mean, that's the one I I was been telling the guys. Like, I want us to get to that because to he me, I think poop that's going to really be bad. the, no, that's not why. <laughs> I just think that well, will they, be the, the most enlightening for me yeah. of all the things that we've done so far. He already so. has one in a bag. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, he froze ready, it. He's ready stupid, for it. Yeah. Stupid, stupid. Yeah. All right, say, who's that? Who's, who's the big right. loser? Justin's up next. Oh, oh, the big loser. Hey, well, I would, you know, hey, I thought for sure lot, my gut's a lot better too, but it still must wow. be bad. Yeah. I'm not yeah, shocked. Yeah, yeah, Could yeah. be all those peptides. It's contagious. Yeah. I blame Sal. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So with Justin's, your, the, all of your dairy are basically off the chart. So <laughs> the is, uh, Shocker. It's not going to get any worse than that. <laughs> That's terrible. Terrible. Hey, all of it, bro. All of hey, it. Hey, hey, Dr. Cabral. What? He is You're cutting out. He's, he's, in <laughs> such, he's in such denial over that. We've been telling him this for years, and he just... <laughs> He lives on dairy. Yeah, I knew that, dude. It's just like, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I really do. Oh, but man. All so, I mean, telling you, I'm you sorry, eliminate Justin. dairy, you're going to feel so much better. Wow. Like, I mean, I'm not probably not that you're probably not feeling good now, but you'll feel so much better. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, okay. Justin. Well, it's, 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 I don't know. I'm don't cry. feel bad. I'm going to cry about this. Wait till later. he gets to mine. I'm probably <laughs> yeah. like 58 different foods. That's yeah. it, though. It's just all dairy. Like all of it. <laughs> no, 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 not just dairy. We're gonna, yeah. We'll get to the rest. There's just, yeah, it's I was not, say. but dairy was the ones that were most sensitive. Like okay, it was, like, um, you didn't even go right through there. the specific cheeses or anything. Because bro. all of them, bro. All of them. No, no, Yes, all of them. I mean, all whey, all casein, all goat, all sheep, all. All goat and sheep and all that? Yeah. Good yeah. Lord. Yeah. Yeah. What am I going to do? Yeah. You goat fucker. He's, hey, hey, he's going to lose 20 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the amount yeah. of just inflammation the cost you'll drop will be will be remarkable for sure. If you're someone that's used to eating dairy on a daily basis, like, oh, that's yes. the thing oh, you'll see a remarkable Every meal. Change. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, not, it's not. I don't play. Yeah. So this, right. is, this is this is going to be a shocking you, difference. You're going to cut if you did, even if you did it for 21 days, like just 21 days to kind of humor the lab test. Oh my god, you'd be able to. Can feel, I? Can like I please? You can, feel the can he? Can you please get a soy latte? I'm going to have to document this <laughs> soy. No, I ain't going the soy direction. Yeah, yeah you had the document. We don't have to do it. soy, right? We could do yeah. we could do others as well. But, yeah. Okay, so yeah. also a mild reaction to chickpeas or garbanzo beans. Uh, yeah, screw a that. high reaction to soybeans. Oh. Now, you're probably not eating a lot of soy, but that's why I said there are other outliers, which is why we run this test. Okay. Uh, let's see. Gliadin and, and rye were quite high. So gliadin is a type of protein of gluten. So mm. all gluten-based foods would not, yeah, be, would not be great Cheese for you. Cheese and bread, bro. Rye. Yeah. So no, no rye whiskey, I guess. That's, that's depressing. Oh, too. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be definitely Just part bourbon. of it. Less so than the actual, <coughs> I'm you know, wheat itself and bread. Uh, egg whites was quite high, so that was in the red. And egg yolks are in the moderately high. Mm. Even eggs? What am I supposed to? Again, eat? eggs are the number two sensitivity that we see in the world. Well, believe it or not, yeah. egg whites yeah. number two behind. Well, egg, egg whites are the egg white and the yolk. The white is literally there to protect the yolk, right? It's actually designed to be kind of immune reactive, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Well, the white itself, the reason why it's believed to be more reactive is that, well, there's there's more than double the amount of allergens in it because the white is actually going to grow into the chicken where the yolk is going to feed it the nutrition. Okay. So you're actually reacting more to the, because um, it's an equal amount of protein. So right. a lot of people throw out the the white because they say no, all the proteins in the yolk. But I'm sure you've gone over this. But it's about yeah. three and three, like yeah, for yeah. an egg. So, um, but there's just more allergens in it. Okay, and so you're reacting to that typically um, for sure. Okay, so uh, eggs are, eggs are just a, a huge okay. ones that we see for eczema, especially. As all well. right, get to the bad news here. Come on. <laughs> all right, peanuts peanuts are high. Oh. Uh, oh, quite high. Sesame seeds are moderately high. Peanuts. Celery, actually in vegetable, is moderately high. Celery. It's like water. Celery. Jeez. Bro, he loves peanuts and cheese. That, Justin's so yeah. sad right now. Yeah, th like that's. <laughs> I'm not even gonna talk. We've got yeah. moderate sensitivities in chili and radishes, which is random. Tomatoes, oh. ginger, oh, tomatoes, salsa. basil. Damn, bro. Miso, a Jeez. high reaction to mustard. Oh yes, fuck mustard. 
And <laughs> I love mustard. That's basically it. So remember, when I see more than 10 or so food sensitivities, wow. then I'm also looking at there's some type of gut permeability. There has to be, because yeah, right? Like a, some that's kind what, of We're overgrowth. not saying like you need to eliminate every food in the world. Like that's what, so when yeah. I was 19, and I finally found a natural health based doctor after two years of literally, you know, going through conventional medicine based diagnosis. I had, let's say, 25 to 30 different food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And so, is the goal to eliminate every food that you eat? No, it's uh, eliminate the most egregious ones. That's what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, basically the 80 20 rule there. But you then need to work on sealing up the gut. And you don't actually need to necessarily seal up the gut wall until you rebalance the candida, the bacteria, and anything else that might be there. And that's that's the way to go about this. We could talk more about that if you'd like as well All right. okay. after sales. Jesus okay. Christ. All here right. we go. Well, that was depressing. Thing. He's like, you're the first person yeah. that is sensitive to everything. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, see, <laughs> we, we, see, uh, we see quite a few. All right. So, Sal, you are up. Saving the best for last. And we've got uh, sensitivities, again, to all dairy-based products. Yeah, I know that. All in the red. Uh, I don't have any dairy, so and I haven't for a while, but that just won't go away for me. Yeah, 100%. And that actually happens. That's interesting. That happens for quite a number of people. Egg will go down. So we've seen dairy not go down for some people. Uh, it is the number one food sensitivity from an IgG perspective. I've seen eggs go down after a 12-week to six month based elimination, yeah. because what happens is your immune cells become then desensitized to that. They're no longer seeing it, which means they're no longer reacting. As those immune cells turn over, you get healthier ones. Those ones no longer carry the memory to react to those specific uh, amino acids. So, okay. All right. So we've got dairy. After that, I'll just going to read them off. We've got uh, azuki bean, we've got garbanzo beans, kidney beans, lima beans, mung beans, navy beans, all soy beans. beans tofu, coconut, pineapple, which okay. is random, gliadin, okay, rye. Okay. Yep. All gluten. Your eggs are very, are very really sensitive all the way to the end. All eggs? Uh, for eggs. Yep. For eggs. <laughs> 12, a, 12 a day guy. <laughs> yeah. Quail eggs? Anchovies. So mad. Okay. Uh, mackerel, red snapper, tilapia. Let's see what else we have. Almonds, Brazil nuts, cashews, chia. Peanut, pistachio, Whoa. pumpkin, sesame, Whoa. walnut. Whoa. We've Whoa. got kelp, like in terms of seaweed. Damn it. Just kidding. I'm I know. I know. <laughs> Cayenne pepper That's and fine. mustard is mild. Vanilla bean. This is one of the first times I've seen vanilla bean high. It's huh. high. And bromelain is high. We often see bromelain high just as a digestive enzyme or pancreatic, uh, not pancreatic, but proteolytic enzyme that we don't do too much about. But so again, when I look at your cell, there was a number, right? So there's well over, let's say a dozen. So what I'm looking to do are remove the most egregious, but also if it's not someone that can remove, let's say eggs every day or whatever it might be, what we do is we actually put someone on a rotation diet so that you're only eating that food every three days. Can I so we create a What's that? Oh, I was going to add something. I, actually, none of those surprised me. Uh, none of those have surprised me. So I avoid dairy 100%. Eggs I push, uh, but then I'll go off of them for a while. So I'm going to go off that for a while. The beans didn't surprise me. I know how I react after I eat beans. I tend to get kind of foggy, a little tired, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Gassy. Um, the, gassy. The, 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 the seeds and nuts, I also noticed. If I eat like a bunch of nuts, I tend to not feel so... Actually, nothing that you said surprised me on there. It's all that the fish maybe a little bit, but I don't eat a ton of fish. And I, and part of it is because it doesn't make me feel so good sometimes. Uh, right. But sardines I'll eat sometimes. So actually nothing you said surprised me. And I avoid most of those foods except for eggs. So in other words, all the stuff you listed, I eat beans at most once a week, at most. I eat, never eat dairy. Nuts, I'll eat at most once a week. Um, and all the other stuff you, I don't eat cayenne pepper. I noticed it bothers my gut. I don't eat anything else. So could these be long lasting ones besides the one that I eat, you know, like the eggs, which I eat on a, on a, on a very regular basis. Well, I just want to share too. I work with a lot of bodybuilders, people that eating, you know, good amount to put on muscle mass and, and all that. And they have a tendency to have more inflamed guts Period. just because their body's always processing far more. And they can come in contact with then just larger amounts okay. of protein, which could be more reactive. So part of it is is just what I see in working with 
um, even athletes and bodybuilder based communities. So I do see that. What I would say is that you're not sensitive to, though, to beef and chicken and turkey and all those others. And so that can then at least allow you to consume those with no real issue while eliminating the eggs and definitely eliminating the dairy. But I don't often see the beans and the nuts to that level. Everybody has maybe like one or two, yeah. but that definitely, it signals to me that there's more of an inflammatory issue that I would want to investigate. Okay. Same with Justin. So yeah. I'd want to look deeper. I'd simply want to run the other part of the big three, which is the candida metabolic and vitamins test yeah. and the bacteria and parasite stool test. I'll do that. Because then we'll see is there overgrowth of bacteria, overgrowth of yeast, or potentially parasites um, or H. pylori, and then we can fix those. Yeah, I want to do the stool yeah. test still too. I, so is there a possibility that I could like I'll, I'll avoid all the foods that you said on my list 100%. I'll be dialed for the next 30 days. Is there a potential that I'll still I still will have my psoriasis as an issue? And if so, what what's the next step for me to to go deeper? Yeah, that's that's actually it's a good point because eliminating your food sensitivities will help many people eliminate the headaches, the skin rashes, the brain fog, the joint pain, etc. Um, but it doesn't mean that that was your only underlying root cause. And so if there's still candida or there's still bacterial overgrowth or again, parasites or H. pylori, those are basically, I keep naming those because the those nice the thing is ones. there's really only four things that go wrong with your gut besides intestinal permeability. So if you figure out what those four are, we'll assume intestinal permeability since it's almost impossible to really know uh, unless you do an intestinal biopsy, which there's no need to do because you can simply just use uh, zinc and glutamine and aloe vera. We, we use something called healthy gut support that patches it back up. But you don't even necessarily want to patch up your gut, which you can do without fixing the issues that are on the inside, because you're just going to continue with more inflammation, which will then cause more intestinal permeability again. Right. So that's how we work it. So for sure, um, I'd recommend for at least, uh, yeah, Adam, you as well, but Justin and Sal, that we just take things to the next level, run the candida metabolic vitamins test, run the bacteria parasite stool test. Let's figure out exactly what's going on. Get you on a protocol and your gut will be literally fixed in 12 to 16 weeks maximum. Yeah, I really, I yeah. want to, because I, I think there's been, obviously right now I admitted that I just, you know, ordered six quarts of ice cream. So I've been on an ice cream kick lately, which is, I know not good for me. You have but, to finish it all first, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah this, doesn't, this episode doesn't go live for a little while, so I still have some time to finish all this. <laughs> you should see my drawer of cheese. No, oh. so I, but I, I do, I, I believe I've been on a streak before and actually not consumed any of those foods. So I, I'm, but I'm going to be dialed per, I'll be perfect for 30 days at least so I can see yeah. what happens. But I, I have a I have a feeling I'm still going to see psoriasis. What's what's cool well, for me, what's cool about this is because I've dealt with gut issues on and off for so long, Dr. Cabral, that I'm very hypervigilant um, and I kind of know what to look for myself. And I'm not surprised by any of the ones that you, that you, you sent me. Um, and I can totally avoid those. I avoid dairy always anyway. Gluten, I have super rarely. Um, and the rest of them, I mean, I, I kind of know and I mostly avoid, but I don't, but I'm going to completely avoid them. And then I'm really interested to see what these, what the stool test says to see what's going on, uh, with the, with the gut inflammation. Let me ask you this, Dr. Dr. Cabral, because I've done SIBO protocol, uh, CIFO SIBO protocol. Uh, I've, uh, done anti-parasite protocol, my gut health as, uh, as compared as how it used to be with how, mm -hmm my digestion is and all that stuff is light years ahead. Okay. Could somebody simply have hyperpermeability, not because of, let's say one of the four that you listed, but just too much stress. Maybe they just hold too much stress and it just affects their gut. hundred okay. yeah, percent. You're exactly right. So okay. that's the thing is that stress they found just in a, now people shouldn't be overly worried about this, but a great amount of stress, even in a day, begins to increase gut permeability. The nice thing is, though, it can start to move back quickly as well once okay. the inflammation and the stressor is over. It's really chronic stress and the chronic conditions that we may put our gut under that cause this. And that's why intermittent fasting is so helpful as well, because at least for a period of time, 12 hours, 16 hours or so a day, you're allowing the gut to move all the food through. It's been digested and there's no other assault on the gut. It. It's also why I don't like people really eating necessarily more than three to four meals per day. Because mm. if you're eating more times per day, then the gut is always on. There's always some type of oxidative stress from the digestive process. And there's more potential uh, for also these, these uh, immune-based reactions. Yeah. I'm going to guess that for me, it's it's going to be stress, but I don't know. We'll see what the test is. Because you know I have, I have an ex-wife, a wife, and four kids. So... <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. A lot going on. Well, one thing I would add though, is um, just how like you've done, you've done a really good job at 
figuring out and knowing what bothers you. And so you're removing the things that have bothered you, but maybe not necessarily doing like the deeper level yeah. repair to then allow you to. And the thing I wanted to mention to people is, okay, you eliminate them for the six weeks, 12 weeks, or six months, but only add them back once a week. See how you do. Yeah. See if there's a reaction a day or two days later. Like that's what you still have to look for. Okay. If that's okay, then you add it back in like on a Monday and a Thursday. So you add it back twice a week. Okay. Is there a reaction? Yes or no? No. Good. And so that's what I would do. And I would typically tell people once you've um, eliminated for the time that you need to, let's say, let's say it was um, Justin or Sal, I would do another lab test six months later to make sure that these sensitivities have gone way down. And I bet that you'll find if you do something like a CBO protocol, a CBO finisher to heal and seal the gut, that you will see a remarkable difference, but you'll feel the results right away. That's that's the amazing thing about a food sensitivity test. Like whether you agree with it or not, like or believe in it or not, like I don't know what this whole doctrine of belief is about these things, but eliminate them, see how you feel. And people honestly, they typically feel remarkably better just from again emptying that rainbow. I'm gonna yeah. tell you something that I know is gonna make you cringe, okay? But I want to tell you something that I figured out for <laughs> myself. Probably not the best approach, but I did notice for myself if I push certain foods, gluten in particular that I'll start to get uh, hives, very small, random hives here and there. So I've noticed for myself that if I take an antihistamine when I'm doing this with uh, and pushing certain foods, I get less overall reactions and even less gut reactions. That's definitely a Band-Aid, right? That's not the best approach, but I do notice some symptom relief. Is that something you would ever advocate for or am I just being dumb? Well, I know why you're doing that. I can't advocate for it because what we're doing is basically it's it's the band aid, right? It's the band aid okay. pretending the issue isn't there by taking an antihistamine. But just keep in mind, you still have the inflammatory reactions the day, the two, the three days after from that IgG based response. And in, in the histamine, so it's actually a cytokine based produced. And uh, honestly, it's meant to be there in the body. So although we don't like a histamine-based reaction, think about getting stung by a bee or you get a wound or you get hit or whatever it might happen. You get a histamine-based reaction to bring healing processes to that part of the body. So you're actually then dampening the what's called the TH2-based response. So it's essentially, it's an allergy-based response, but our body is not messing up. That's what I always just try to share with okay. people. Um, the issue is that it can become exaggerated. I mean, nobody wants to have hives or nobody wants to have, you know, itchy eyes or itchy skin, et cetera. So I, I totally get it. But obviously my goal instead of an antihistamine would be use something like, uh, we use a product called HistPro, but it's quercetin yeah. and it's vitamin C and it's bromelain and stinging nettles. And it works fantastic as well. Now you need two to three. You can't just take one antihistamine, but yeah. Interesting. I use that instead. Interesting. Okay. How, how, so this is a food sensitivity test. What's the cost of, of running a test like this and having someone go through them with you? It's typically three ninety nine. dollars So this lab comes with also a 30 minute consultation to take you through the results, just like I did uh, with the four of you here today. And I know that your community always gets a discount for uh, us obviously being super appreciative of you having me on and spreading the message about at-home lab testing, which is really my mission is to just share with people, there is a way to figure out your underlying root causes. Um, and it really starts with at-home lab testing. So I know you have a link, you'll link that up, I'm sure, in yeah, the show notes and share it with people because I don't actually always know what that is, but <laughs> our teams work together and we make that happen. So uh, it is one of those things that I believe that people should run once a year. I'm a huge advocate of it and they can do it with their kids as well. So my daughters do a food sensitivity test once a year for sure. And that's just what we do as a family. And it's three years old and up, not under three, but three years old and up. And for, for people who know the test is super easy. It's literally a, 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 a prick on your finger and you, you put some drops of blood on a card. Yeah, it takes five, 10 minutes Nothing. at home. Talk about the benefits for somebody. It's obvious if you're, you're struggling with an autoimmune, like psoriasis, like I am, or Justin trying to get to his gut issues, like that, and it's, and we can see it or feel it. But what about the benefits for someone who who feels pretty healthy and thinks that they're like totally fine? Like the value of that person still doing a, a test like this is there still value to that person to getting it tested? Yeah, and even I mean, I'll just use myself as an example. So I grew up as a really sick kid. I had allergies. I had all sorts of health issues. Then from seventeen to twenty seven, I've shared my story before. Debilitating autoimmune issues, like my immune system was literally just wiped out. I had Addison's disease, type two diabetes, all sorts of health issues. So for me, it's like cracking the code. It's figuring out 
how to get well. And I did get well. I met my mentor, got well at 27, but I've continued to get well each year, like literally feeling better each and every year. And right now I'm 45, I'm in my mid forties. And my goal now is just to reduce biological age. And on the last show that we did together, my goal was to continue to read reduce biological age and it can be measured now on a lab test. And I I don't have great genetics. So I now, and I didn't have this information when I was on the show, my biological age now is aging at a rate of 0.67. Wow. And my biological age is eight years younger. And I have horrible That's genetics. Awesome. I have a terrible background with my immune system. And so I just share that with people that you don't have to have good genetics. You don't have to have all these things. The goal is just to continue to try to dial it in little by little. And it's never one massive thing that you can do. So I again, I figure out, okay, yeah, you're still sensitive to almonds. Don't eat almonds, right? Don't have almonds. It's like, it's one thing. Okay. And then what's the other thing? Oh, your evening cortisol is a little elevated. Okay. Let's let's knock that down a little bit with blue light, with taking you know, ashwagandha, L-theanine, fossil serine, like these things that you can do. And little by little, your body continues to regenerate, literally, if it's your gut every few days. But on average, your body regenerates every 120 days. And that at least goes for your red blood cells. So the goal is every three to four months, get a little bit better. Three to four months, get a little bit better. And over time, that's how you get those anti-aging and longevity-based benefits. Love that's awesome. Love that. Do, uh, are these tests covered by a uh, health savings account uh, by people have, you know, being able to, what is that called? HSA accounts? Are they, do they cover these? Uh, FSA and HSA can sometimes be covered. You simply send in your receipt, you send in what you ran for the lab, and oftentimes uh, you're able to okay. get that taken off. So awesome. not always, because these are non-diagnostic. So that's the thing. We're not diagnosing any particular disease with this. But again, old disease comes from a root cause. We're trying to figure out what these root causes are. Right? Yeah. Highly, this is the one test I, I tend to recommend uh, the most because I feel it's easy to take. And it can lead to other more specific tests, like you said, the like the stool test and parasite. Well, now it's so easy for me to go test too. Like I literally have a list of all these foods that I just, okay, I disciplined myself for three to four weeks to be committed to none of it being in a diet. And then the, the, the hopefully the results will speak for themselves on how I feel. So I highly that's recommend. That's exactly the yeah. point. If you just do a 21-day elimination, see how you feel. Don't, don't change any other variable except the eliminated foods from this lab test. And most people will feel a dramatic difference. And so with that difference, they say, okay, well, I want to do more of that. That's always the goal. It's okay. What's the mm. next step then? And so that's it. Just 21 day elimination to start. Don't worry about the six weeks or the six months or the whatever it is. Just start with 21 days. Love awesome. It. Dr. Love Cabral, it. always awesome to have you on the show. Thank you so much for helping us out. Can't wait to I have you on. Having again, me on. Thanks appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah appreciate so it looks it. like the next one we'll do is the, uh, the poop test, huh? Yeah, stool. Mm. Stool's right. next. Let's do that next, sir. Whenever you're ready. All Got right. it. All right. Thanks again, Dr. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too.